Long ago, an everlasting being called Morax was born and descended into Lie. From him, formed dominion over rock and stone, thus inheriting the title of Lord of Geo. When he first descended, much of western Lie was covered with water, and the people living at that time were at the mercy of monsters and gods that ruled the seas. One such monster was Bachio, first mentioned in the primordial jade Wingspear, described as a behemoth that dominated the seas and could form waves which could wash away entire settlements. However, this beast was never meant to live long, and Morax wanted to defeat Bachio and lower the tides that flowed within Lie. He first summoned a whale to fight this beast, but still could not triumph against it. So Morax devised another plan and summoned a stone bird as his second companion. He fashioned this stone bird with a black kite made from jade and stones and used it on the battlefield with Baccio and the whale. By the end, Baccio sank and is said to stay there forever. With its final roar, the people of Lia were now free. Using his divine powers, Morax raised Mount Tienhem and the people of Lia began mining from the mountains he raised and used the stones they mined to create settlements. All of them prospered and none of them tasted poverty. In the past, they would mine the ore veins of Mount Tienhom and then replace the cavities with factory equipment. Tunnels run in all directions throughout the mountain. Some even run to the ruins deep within the earth. Unbeknownst to Morax, there was another god named Guizhong who descended before him. This god whose dominion over dust laid down four commandments for her people. Her commandments are as follows. Unite in ambition. Teach with wisdom. Fortify the bones. Be bound by virtue. She was adored by her people and wished for them to be wise, to hold themselves to a moral code, to be strong and healthy and to find solidarity in the shared ambition of protecting their home. Eventually, Guizhong met Morax, befriending him and jointly ushered the people of Lia for their protection. Their first meeting was written in the Memory of Dust, wherein Morax remembers meeting this young woman with the billowing sleeves and the way she acted solemnly, yet seemed joyful when Guizhong presented him this token. Even though there was no formal contract between them, and were just two people walking the same path for their own reasons, they made an agreement that they would both have the same goal of protecting the people of Lie. Those little people are as small and fragile as dust. Because they are so small, they know not when they will lose their lives to disaster or strife, and so they are afraid. Because they are afraid, they try so hard to become more intelligent, this I understand. So I thought that since there is such a gulf between us in strength, I should use technique and wisdom instead. With your brawn and my brains, this city would surely become a great one. So Guizhong brought her people to the north of Mount Tianheng and taught them to tend the soil. They formed a civilization known as the Guili Assembly which derives its name from the first character of Guizhong's name and the second character of Morax, using a different name at the time, which is unknown. Within the Guili assembly lived some other gods, such as the god of the stove, Marchosius, known today as Guba, Xiangling's friend slash pet, and a number of adepti that helped in the Guili assembly's prosperity, named Cloud Retainer, Mountain Shaper, Moon Carver, Sky Bracer, Madame Ping, and Ganyu's parent. Agriculture became the livelihood of the Guili Assembly, and so they prospered and became a rich civilization. Amazed and happy, Guizhong said to the Lord of Rock, My people had left their home and came to this place. Here, they are happy in their abodes and content in their work. Thus, it is as if they have returned home. Hence, what would be a better name to call this place rather than the plains of the returning and departing? Morax praised Guizhong for her work and decided that the area be named the Guili Plains. At its peak, 
The Gwaili Assembly was said to have a territory of over a thousand miles around, assuming its territory was a circle with Gwaili Plains as its epicenter. Through in-game measurements, it was said that Stone Gate was its northern boundary, Druin Karst as its western boundary, the end of Minion Village as its eastern boundary, and the area that is now the entrance to Lia Harbor was its southern boundary. This is all speculation, of course, because we really have no clue what the scope of the Gwaili Assembly's territory looked like. However, the fact remains that Guizhong set up a crossbow around Mount Tianhong and named it the Guizhong Ballista, maybe to serve as protection for their southern boundary, which we later found to be broken and in disrepair. Guizhong Ballista. It's a kind of crossbow turret installed on Mount Chinhung by an adeptus in the distant past. An early mechanical device. Located in Chinhung Pass, it was designed to automatically fire at large monsters, protecting Liyue from external threats. Spare parts were made for the Guizhong Ballista when it was first built, in case it was damaged in battle. After millennia of wear and tear, even Adepti contraptions are difficult to maintain. In its heyday, this was a truly mighty weapon, appearing as an intricate machine of divine conception that protected their people. With its borders secured and its people thriving, the Gwaili Assembly entered a time of peace. Suddenly, there came a period when the gods of Tevat coveted a seat at one of the seven divine thrones in Celestia. Each strove for dominance that started an era of catastrophe and destruction, which is known today as the Archon War. I believe that you've heard of the Archon War. Many gods used to walk this earth, and many long wars were fought between them that did not abate until 2,000 years ago. Much blood was shed, and many lives were lost. During this time, one particular battle occurred in the Gwaili Plains that affected Morax, Guizhong, Marchosius, and the Adepti. This battle of black dust and splintered rocks reached their civilization. Even though all of them, including the Adepti and Marchosius, fought to protect the Gwaili Plains, they could not stop the tide of war which ravaged the Gwaili Assembly and took the life of one of its rulers, Guizhong. Her death also marked the fall of the Gwaili Assembly. As a result, Morax took his people south of Mount Tianheng, departed from the Gwaili Plains for good, leaving it to become a wilderness which we can see today. Morax continued to protect his people from other gods that threatened them, despite losing one of his close companions. Still, the Adepti and Yakshas were there to fight beside him and continued to guide the people south of Mount Tianheng. Morax then decides to wage war against the other gods, seeing it as the only way to restore order and protect humanity. During the days of Archon War in Lie, the gods waged war for centuries on end, and not one field was left unravaged. In its final days, Morax was the one who triumphed and pacified all opposing gods. You can see Goyun Stone Forest from here, I trust. It is no natural rock formation. Those are giant spears of rock hurled by Rex Lapis during the war. Beneath the spears lie those cast down by Rex Lapis in those days, gods that failed to seize the title of Archon. In the end, only seven victors remained standing in Tevat. They built cities and nations on the corpses of the vanquished, and thus began the era of the Seven. Those who escaped or were not content with living under Morax's rule fled to the Dark Sea. This Dark Sea is a term for the people of Tevat to refer to any location beyond Tevat's boundaries, meaning there are those who dwell there that do not live under the dominion of the Seven. However, there were those gods whose malice poured into Lia, and so Morax gathered the Yakshas, belligerent illuminated beasts, to assist him in the task of subduing the remnants of other gods defeated during the war. Ultimately, Morax became the Geo Archon, and the Adepti and Yakshas were content in their positions, as long as they continued to fulfill their contracts and commit loyalty to the Lord of Geo. When the Archon War came to its end 2,000 years ago, 
The first iteration of the Seven would gather in Leoa and drink with Rex Lapis. Finally, Morax establishes a village and teaches his people how to create houses, using Mora to create a model home. He also establishes minted Mora as Liwa's currency, for convenience. Gold is Liwa's treasure. It is the blood that runs through her heart. This village then grew to a prosperous city known today as Lie Harbor. After creating Lie Harbor, Morax creates a contract with the Adepti to defend it no matter the cost. According to our records, the Adepti signed a contract with Rex Lapis to protect Liyue 3,700 years ago. The people of Lia Harbor turned to commerce and artisanship for their livelihood. Those who prospered above the rest formed an organization of only seven elite merchants and business leaders. These seven people came to be known as the Lia Tsing. Their jobs were to implement the policies laid out by the Geo Archon Morax and manage the day-to-day -day governance of the nation of Lia. When the Geo Archon built Lia, he borrowed power from the Adepti, but most of them only know how to protect Lia by fighting. So for many millennia, it has instead been humans who have led Lia. The Millith Brigade was also established under the Tsing's command to protect the people and defend against monsters. With an established government, a military force, a currency in the nation of trade and commerce, the framework around Lie Harbor developed, and Lie re-entered an era of peace. Since the end of the Arkan War was now 2,000 years ago, the immense strength of the Adepti was no longer needed to fight the gods that opposed Morax, and so most of them have gone into seclusion in Jiyun Karst caught off from the rest of the world and watching over Lia from afar. According to legend, some Adepti decided that they did not want to wait around for their lives to come to a natural end, and requested Morax to transform them into stone statues. It is said that these stone statues are capable of moving around even in this state. Liyue is the most prosperous of the Seven Nations, defended by deities and ruled by the Qixing. But many Adepti have left us over the millennia. This is the inexorable trend. In years past, Liu's tradition was that a huge memorial service be held to mark the passing of every Adeptus. As you have seen, the time of the Adepti is ending, and the time of mankind is slowly dawning. Although it has become simplified over time, and is beginning to fade into obscurity, it is a Leia tradition to mark the passing of every Adeptus with the memorial service called the Rite of Parting. This service is handled by the Wangsheng Funeral Parlor, though they have only had to host this service a handful of times throughout the past 3,000 years. When we finished our story in Leia, we learned that it is now a thriving port of trade and commerce, mostly handled by humans. This was now the end of an era for gods and the Adepti, and a new age for humankind. The country of contracts is grateful to the Adepti for their protection, but it is no longer necessary for the city to rely on the Adepti's power to solve every little niggling matter. Although their blood is weak, there is still strength to be found in those we call mortals. The time of contracts between gods and Liyue has long since passed. Now is the time of contracts between Liyue and its people. Finally, to end this story, there is no doubt that Morax still misses Guizhong. He continues to remember the scene of their first meeting when the glaze lilies were still in abundant bloom. He also remembers those words she spoke at the end, again, amidst the glaze lilies. With your brawn and my brains, this city would surely become a great one. Her final smile was a lonely one, even as her form dissolved into the finest dust. It seems that our journey together has come to an end. As for that stone dumbbell, forget about it, would you? This is the mark of our pledge, and it is also my challenge to you. All my wisdom is hidden within this stone dumbbell, if you can unlock it. Many years passed, and he was never able to unlock that dumbbell, nor would he ever learn what might have followed that sentence. Over the years, 
the wild glaze lilies to dwindle till at last there were no more. Still, she would be proud of seeing how the people they once sought to protect were now the capable and independent nation they currently are. Now that Morax has departed as the Jew Archon, he lives within his established city and continues to relive their memories from everlasting legends told by his people. This ends my story about the rise and fall of the Gwaili Assembly and how Liye Harbor came into fruition as it is right now. I have to admit, that story about the Marchosius and the Gwaili Assembly inspired me to make this video and share the details of the story behind it. I wish we could get to see what Guizhong looked like and maybe a story teaser of her first meeting with Morax. Now, if you have some thoughts about the video, as well as suggestions for future ideas, leave a comment and let us know. Thank you very much for watching, and if you hung around till the end and think it deserves one, give this video a like. Once again, my name is Clemenson, and as usual, until the next one, be safe and stay tuned.